In this video, we're going to look at the sliding filament theory of muscular contraction. If you're following this in your AQA A2 textbook by Tool & Tool, you want to be looking at pages 184 to 190. Here are our objectives for this video. We're going to look at key structures in muscle tissue. We're going to understand how to interpret sarcomere diagrams. And we're going to explain how actin and myosin interact to allow muscular contraction to occur. Let's start by looking at the structure of skeletal muscle. Now, skeletal muscle is the muscle that we consciously control. Of course, you've got two other types of muscle. You've got smooth muscle, which is what your organs contain to allow things like peristalsis and churning of stuff in your stomach to occur. But we don't have conscious control over those. Also, we've got cardiac muscle which, well, allows your heart to beat, really, controlled by the sinoatrial node, the pacemaker of the heart, with a little bit of um, feedback from the, the brain, the medulla. But skeletal muscle is what we're interested in today. So muscles are comprised of millions and millions of separate myofibrils. Now, those myofibrils we can see on the diagram go to make up larger muscle fibers, which go to make up the muscle as a whole. Now, myofibrils alone are pretty weak. But when you've got millions of these guys working together, they can be pretty strong. Many myofibrils make up that muscle fibre which I was talking about just a second ago. And muscle fibres share a cytoplasm, which we call the sarcoplasm, which is rich in mitochondria for generating ATP by aerobic respiration, and rough endoplasmic reticulum is also pretty abundant too. Interestingly, the rough ER in this case is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So sarco is a sort of prefix that we associate with muscles. So on the diagram, we've also got the sarcolemma, which is effectively the cell membrane of a muscle fiber. So sarcolemma, sarcoplasm, and sarcoplasmic reticulum. And in a minute, we're going to look at the sarcomere. In fact, let's look at that now. Here is a microscope image of a sarcomere. A sarcomere is one contractile unit that will make up a myofibril. So there we go. Myofibrils are made up of many repeating contractile units, and they're called sarcomeres. And in these, we can see from the diagram, we have two types of fiber. A thick fiber, which is the dark color, and a thin fiber, which we can barely see. Now, actin is the thin protein fiber, and myosin is the thick one. Now, the way I remember this is actin is a shorter word, and therefore thinner, than myosin, which is a bigger word, and therefore thicker. It works for me. You might find that you might want to remember it by thinking as actin is thin, which kind of rhymes. And there's nothing rhymy for myosin, so we'll just leave it there. So here's actin. Now actin has two molecules or two strands that are twisted around each other to make a simple helix. Now wrapped around that helix, we've also got a coil of tropomyosin. Now there are some other bits there as well, like a troponin complex, but we're not really going to worry about this in this video. So just two strands twisted, two protein strands twisted to make up your actin, and they're surrounded by a coil of tropomyosin, the importance of which will become clear in a bit. Myosin is another strange looking beast. Now this guy's got long rod shaped fibres with these bulbous heads that sort of kick off to one side, and myosin make up they kind of bunch together to make really thick fibers with those heads kicking off at various places. If you look in your textbook on page 188, at the top of there, there is a nice, uh, a nice diagram of a myosin filament and how myosin molecules comprise that myosin filament. So here's a sarcomere, or rather, more accurately, here are two sarcomeres. And these are those two little contractile units that make up the myofibrils. Now, in this, I've put the thin filaments, that's the actin, in blue, and I've put the myosin, which are the thick filaments, in red. And there are a couple of key regions that you need to understand. The simplest one to understand is the Z-line. Now, the Z-lines are basically the perimeter, the outer edges of each individual sarcomere. So here we've got three Z-lines, so one on the left of the first sarcomere, one in between the two sarcomeres, and one on the right of the second sarcomere. And I've done it as a sort of zigzaggy line to help you remember Z-line. The other key regions we've got at the top 
I've labeled the H zone in red. It's red because an H zone is the region between two actin filaments in one sarcomere where only the myosin is present. Okay, so only the myosin is present in the H zone. In the I band, this is between two adjacent sarcomeres, we've only got actin. The A band is between, oh, but well, basically, the A band is the length of the myosin, but we can have both myosin and actin in the A band because there's a bit of an overlap there. So here we go. H zone is myosin only, I band is actin only, and the A band contains both actin and myosin. So this is the sarcomere when it's relaxed. Ignore that switching round, it's just a quirk of my dodgy animation skills. So here is a, two relaxed sarcomeres that are adjacent to one another. And watch what happens when these guys contract. Okay, so they've contracted together. The fibres of the two proteins have passed over one another to make those two sarcomeres shorter. Now we have a couple of key points that we have to pick up on. First one is the H zone gets smaller. That's the distance between the two actin filaments in the same sarcomere. Okay? Remember the H zone is where we only have myosin, so we have less a, a smaller area of only myosin because of the overlap that's occurred. The I band also gets smaller. This shows that again those two protein molecules have passed over one another. So a smaller region where there is only actin. The A band though is the same size because myosin doesn't get any shorter. We could also say that the Z lines become closer together because the whole sarcomere is shortened. Oh, there we go. Z lines become closer because the sarcomeres have shortened. And these four things together are all evidence for something called the sliding filament theory. Under the microscope, this is what it looks like. So we've got relaxed on the top um, where we have the the different structures clear. The darker regions are where we get the overlap. We can see the Z lines quite nicely there as thick bands. The contracted muscle, we see that the um, the region where we only have actin is a lot shorter. That's the lighter regions. So let's have a look at the mechanism for this sliding filament theory. This is quite a difficult thing to understand um, and there are certainly a lot of steps to this. My animation isn't the best but at the end of this video, I've included an excellent link to a Welcome Society, sorry, Welcome Trust website, um, and they've got a much, much better animation that you can watch. So the first step, um, now we've got myosin at the top with the myosin head kicking off it. We've got ADP bound to that. We'll see the importance of that in a moment. We've got actin at the bottom, and we've got that tropomyosin coiled around it, blocking the binding sites. Now those binding sites are where the myosin head needs to lock into. So at the minute, tropomyosin is blocked, or blocking the, the binding sites. What's going to happen is when you get a nerve impulse arriving at a neuromuscular junction, that electrical impulse, that action potential, is going to spread out through the sarcolemma and down these things called T-tubules, um, which cause the endoplasmic reticulum to release lots of calcium ions. And those calcium ions cause the tropomyosin to move, and that exposes the binding sites on the actin molecule which is going to allow our myosin head to bind. So here we go. Ignore things flying around left, right and centre on this animation. I've tried to do this as, as simply as I can. So the myosin head is then going to attach to the binding site. And it's going to move along the actin. So the, the myosin is static. The myosin head changes the angle, which causes the actin to be shifted along with like a ratchet mechanism. At this point, ADP is released and moves away. AT ATP, as adenosine triphosphate, is now going to come along and attach to the myosin head. This has caused it to detach. This is sometimes called recocking. There you go. So it's detached. And the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP by the enzyme ATPase is going to provide the energy to, to remove the myosin head back to its original position. And from that original position, it can then bind to another binding site on the actin to repeat the whole process. So that's how that's sort of how it works. So tropomyosin moves, reveals binding sites, myosin head binds, shifts the actin molecule along, 
ADP is released, ATP comes along, binds to the myosin head, the whole thing moves away, detaches from the actin, and gets recocked and binds in a new location to repeat. It's quite tricky, but it's something that you've just got to sit down, break down into short steps, and learn it. So there's quite a nice analogy of this using rowing. So along the top we've got what's going on in the actin and myosin interactions, and at the bottom we've got a guy in a rowing boat. So the first step where the myosin attaches to the actin is where you put your oars in. The ratcheting of the actin along is where you pull and try and move your boat forward. The ATP causing the detachment of the myosin head is where you pull your oars out. And then the myosin moving again is you moving your oars back into the next position ready to start the cycle again. That's quite a nice little analogy there. Now, if we want to finish muscular contraction, uh, this happens basically when nervous stimulation stopped. So you're not going to get any more, um, any more electrical activity coming down your motor neuron to your neuromuscular junctions. No more calcium ions are going to be released. And that means that tropomyosin is going to recover the binding sites on the actin. Now, for this to occur, you're going to need absolutely massive amounts of ATP. And that's to recock the myosin heads. ATP is normally produced by aerobic respiration in those little organelles, the mitochondria, but for that you need a massive supply of oxygen. So in active muscles, in really, really active muscles, you need a way that you can generate ATP anaerobically. And to do that we use an alternative metabolic pathway using something called phosphocreatine. And basically what phosphocreatine does is it acts as a backup store of phosphate to regenerate ATP from ADP without the need for oxygen. Let's summarise this whole thing. Muscle fibres are made up of myofibrils, which are in turn made up of many sarcomeres. These are contractile units. Actin and myosin are proteins which slide over one another to cause contraction in the sliding filament theory. Calcium ions cause binding sites to be revealed on actin. Myosin binds to actin, ratchets along and then unbinds. ATP recocks the myosin head, ready to repeat the cycle. Now, like I said, my animations aren't the best for this. So if you want a really, really slick animation, I suggest you go to the Welcome Trust website. If you scan this with your smartphone using a QR code app, you'll be directed to a really, really excellent animation. Now, I believe it's flash-based. This might not work on your iPhones and iPads. So it might be worth using either an Android phone or doing this on a laptop or desktop. I'll put a link just hovering over this hyperlink here so you can click it directly from YouTube. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.